You've learned that in the quantum mechanical model, you can describe the most probable location of any electron in an atom using four different quantum numbers. In this PowerPoint, we're going to look at orbital filling diagrams and electron configurations as a more visual way of mapping all the electrons in an atom. An orbital filling diagram is a visual representation of all the different quantum number combinations and the different electron orbitals those combinations represent. We use them to map electrons in their ground state, or lowest potential energy state, in an atom. And this is one example of an orbital filling diagram. The principal energy levels and sublevels are represented by numbers and letters, while the lines, the dashes, indicate individual orbitals that can each hold two electrons. So here's another example of an orbital filling diagram. This one's a little more compact than the one on the last screen, but it contains the same basic features. The, here the boxes represent the individual orbitals, and each box holds two electrons. The number and letter inside the box indicate the principal energy level and the sublevel or shape of that orbital. Now, both versions of the orbital filling diagram that I've shown you, this one and the one on the last slide, show a separation in energy between the different sublevels. With those that are closer to the nucleus and therefore have a lower potential energy at the bottom of the filling diagram, and uh, farther out from the nucleus with higher potential energy, those levels are represented higher up on the filling diagrams. Now, uh, this particular filling diagram only goes to 4D. Um, the only reason this only goes to 4D is because that's what could fit onto this screen and still be visible and readable. The Sublevels and principal energy levels in an actual atom go out much further than this. They go, uh, they include Fs, which also we didn't go out far enough to see the first F sublevel showing up. Um, they go out sixth, seventh, eighth en energy level. So, uh, so this is just limited solely because that's what fit onto the screen. But you should know that they do go out further. Another consistent pattern that we see in any particular orbital filling diagram is actually splitting of those higher energy levels. So for example, the 4s sublevel actually comes between 3p and 3d in terms of energy. So as you go further out from the nucleus, the um, differences between in energy between the different principal energy levels actually get smaller and smaller. Those principal energy levels get closer together, ultimately, in terms of energy. And there are some subtle differences in the standing wave patterns associated with S's and, and P sublevels at those higher principal energy levels that um, uh, there's actually some uh, chance for higher uh, density of electrons a little closer to the nucleus. And that allows the energy for the S's and the P's to be a little bit lower. And when the energy levels, the principal energy levels, are so close together, farther out from the nucleus, those lower energy S's and P's can actually penetrate into lower principal energy shells. So the 4S penetrates into the, three, the third principal energy level between 3P and 3D. And the 5s penetrates between the 4p and the 4d. We don't go out far enough to see the uh, f sublevel, but what we find is that the um, uh, 6s and the 5p sublevel are actually a little bit lower in energy than the 4f sublevel. So this is a confusing pattern, I realize that, but orbital filling diagrams always are set up to represent the splitting accurately. So what that means is that when it comes time to map electrons, more often than not, all you have to do is follow a few simple rules and you will get the correct orbital filling diagram. 
There are some exceptions. We will talk about a few of those. But for most elements, you just have to follow some simple rules. And the first of those rules is called the Pauli exclusion principle. It states that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. Now, in terms of orbital filling diagrams, what this ultimately represents is that each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons, but those two electrons have to spin in opposite directions so that they will have two different magnetic spin quantum numbers. So, for example, the 1s orbital can hold two electrons. We represent those electrons as arrows, and those arrows have to point in opposite directions. They have different magnetic spin quantum numbers. The second rule that we have to follow is called the Aufbau principle. And it states that electrons fill the lowest energy sublevels first before moving on to higher energy sublevels. So for any atom, what that means is that we always start at the 1s sublevel. And we fill each level completely before we move up to the next level. So let's look at an example of this. Let's look at carbon, and we're going to map the electrons of carbon in this orbital filling diagram. So carbon has atomic number of six. That means six protons in the nucleus. And for a neutral atom, that also means six electrons. So when we map carbon's electrons, we have six arrows to fill into this orbital filling diagram. And we always start at the bottom, at the 1s, and we fill it completely before we move to the next sublevel. So 1s can hold two electrons, and they have to spin in the opposite direction. So those are our first two electrons. We move to the 2s, and we put the next two. So that's electron number three, electron number four. To get to six, we need two more electrons, and those are going to have to go into the 2p sublevel. Now, in order to fill sublevels that are like the 2p or the 3d or the, the uh, 4f, for example, um, or sublevels that have multiple orbitals all on the same line or the same energy, we follow our third rule. So this is known as Hunt's rule, and uh, it states that electrons fill multiple orbitals at the same energy level. These are also known as degenerate orbitals, one to an orbital first with parallel spins before pairing up. All right, so for carbon, we're going to put two electrons into the 2p orbitals, which are all at the same energy, and they're going to go one to an orbital, so one to a box, spinning in the same direction until we've used up all of our electrons, or we have to go back and start pairing them up. So for carbon, we use up all of our electrons with six electrons. So that's just two in the 2p. But those two electrons have to go in separate boxes, and they're pointing in the same direction. I also call Hunt's rule the school bus rule because this is similar to what happens many times on a school bus. As kids get into a school bus, um, as long as there are empty seats available, most people tend to go to a seat by themselves. They spread themselves out one to a seat. It's only when every seat has a student already that the next person who gets on, this, on the bus has to pair up. They have to sit with somebody else. And electrons are kind of like school kids. They don't want to share their seat. They don't want to share their orbital unless they have to. So they go one to an orbital until they're forced to pair up by more electrons coming in to complete that particular sublevel. All right, so let's look at another example. This time, let's look at sulfur. So it's atomic number 16. That means 16 electrons in a neutral atom, as well as 16 protons. We start at the bottom. We always start at 1s and fill that completely, our two electrons there. Then 3 and 4 goes into 2s. 5, 6, 
seven go into 2p, one to an orbital spinning in the same direction. Then we have to pair them up before we can go to the next one. So then we get eight, nine, 10. Then 11 and 12 go into 3s. We go to 3p, 13, 14, 15. So they all go into separate orbitals spinning in the same direction. And then 16, our last electron, goes back to pair up in the first 3p orbital. Okay, let's look at one last example here. This time we're going to do titanium. So 22 electrons this time. And again, we start at 1s and just work our way up until we've put in 22 arrows. So 1, 2 in the 1s, 3, 4 in 2s, 5, 6, 7 in 2p, and then we go back and pair up 8, 9, 10 in the 2p orbitals. Then we move on to 3s and we put 11 and 12 there. 3p, 13, 14, and 15 fill one to an orbital. And then 16, 17, and 18 pair up to complete the 3p sublevel. 19 and 20 go into 4s. And finally, 21 and 22 go into the 3D. And so we have the same separation into different orbitals for the 3D sublevel as we were seeing with the 3P. As long as those boxes are all on the same line, the electrons are going to fill one to an orbital for the most part before they start pairing up. So hopefully you can see how orbital filling diagrams are a little bit easier to deal with for representing electron orbitals than quantum numbers can be. They are pretty large though, um, and that's not always the most efficient representation of where electrons are. Electron configurations on the other hand, are a shorthand way of representing the filling diagrams. If the orbital filling diagrams are maps of where the electrons are, then the electron configurations are the written directions. So to write an electron configuration, we simply indicate the number of electrons at each sublevel with a superscript after that number and letter combination. For example, a neutral atom of hydrogen contains one electron. And that electron goes into the 1s sublevel. So this is the orbital filling diagram for hydrogen. The electron configuration that represents this is 1s1, with the last one being a superscript that indicates the number of electrons in the 1s subshell, the s sublevel at that first principal energy level. Now, if we were to deal with helium, helium has two electrons, the neutral atom. So the second electron would go in the 1s as well. Now we don't show in an electron configuration the difference in spin. We just give the total number of electrons in that particular sublevel. So helium would have a, an electron configuration of 1s2, two electrons in that 1s orbital. And we can keep going up from there. Lithium has three electrons. So the third one would go in the 2s. And the electron configuration for lithium is actually 1s2, 2s1. So the 1s2 indicates the two electrons that are in that 1s orbital for lithium. And then it's got its third electron in 2s1. You should be able to add together all of those superscripts for number of electrons, and it'll give you the total number of electrons in that particular atom.
So if it's a neutral atom, it will equal the atomic number. Okay, we can keep going up. Uh, beryllium has four electrons. So those four electrons fill the 1s2 and 2s2. So the electron configuration for beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. And then boron has five electrons, and that first one goes into the 2p. So for boron, this is the orbital filling diagram. This is the electron configuration that represents that. Oxygen, I'll skip a few places here. Oxygen goes up to uh, eight electrons. Didn't quite hit the 1s box, but you know it's supposed to go in there. And those eight electrons end up filling the last four in the 2p orbital. So the uh, spin direction on the electrons is not represented in electron configuration. When you have uh, those multiple orbitals at the same energy, so the p, the d, and the f sublevels, it also doesn't indicate which orbital the electrons are in, which box. We lump them all together. So there are four total electrons in those 2p boxes. It's 2p4. So there are some exceptions to the rules in terms of orbital filling and electron configurations. Let's go through two examples. We're going to start with chromium, which has an atomic number of 24. So 24 arrows to fill in. That's starting at 1s, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. In terms of an electron configuration for this particular filling diagram, we would expect it to end with 3d4. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and 3d4. But spectroscopic measurements of chromium indicate that this is not the actual electron configuration. Instead, it appears that this is. It ends in 4s1, 3d5. So this indicates that one of these electrons in the 4s sublevel has actually moved. It's not there it's jumped up to the 3D. Now why would this happen? So the commonly given explanation for this is that uh, a half-filled sublevel is actually a little more stable than a not half-filled sublevel. So by that I mean one electron in each of those orbitals is there's a little boost in stability associated with that. And that extra stability is enough at these higher energy levels for one electron from the 4s to jump to the 3d. The energy levels are so close together that it doesn't necessarily require that much energy for that jump to happen. So there are some other elements that show the same pattern. I'll show you copper as well. Copper has 29 electrons, so 29 arrows. One, two, these are going to be a little bit sloppy. Three, four, I'm trying to go a little more quickly here. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. 26, 27, 28, 29. So for copper, what we would expect for the electron configuration then is that it would end in 4s2, 3d9. But again, spectroscopic measurements indicate that this is not the actual electron configuration. Instead, what you get is 4s1, 3d10. Again, one of those 4s electrons jumps ship 
to the 3D sublevel. The net result, though, is that you get a completely filled 3D sublevel and a half filled 4S. Now, I say that these are the common explanations, but there are those who argue that the reasoning behind these is sloppy, especially because we don't see this pattern of jumping to form half-filled subshells in a consistent manner. You only see it in the transition metals. That's the only place it'll happen, but not all of the transition metals that could have the jumping occur do. And, and some of the transition metals have electrons jump between subshells without producing a half-filled filled subshell. So unfortunately, I just haven't found a good explanation for these exceptions yet. As unsatisfying as this is, I can only offer you these words at this point. Transition metals do not always follow the rules. In summary, orbital filling diagrams are visual representations of the most probable location of all the electrons in an atom, according to the quantum mechanical model. Electron configurations are condensed summaries of the orbital filling diagrams. They show the most probable distribution of electrons into different principal energy levels and sublevels for an atom. The representative elements follow consistent principles in the way electrons fill orbitals that allow us to predict their electron configurations. Some transition metals, however, do not follow these rules.